How I love dragon riding. The climbing, the diving, the swooping, the imagined feeling of the wind in your hair, fur, feathers, or scales. Dragon riding, now called sky riding, has probably been one of the most popular additions to WoW in a long time, and available right from the start of the expansion. No pathfinder needed. But you know what? I kind of miss running around on the ground, exploring the land, finding hidden trails, and charting routes to get to the next quest. I've never been one to say that the introduction of flying ruined the game, but I've also never been one to complain about the existence of Pathfinder. So I thought to myself, nearly two years ago, as I played through Dragonflight for the first time, that, at least once, I would play for the expansion again, but with no flying. I didn't even know if it was possible, but I wanted to try. Just me, my legs, my mount's legs, maybe some goblin gliders, a dark moon cannon, glide, fell rush, ventral retreat. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna do this on a demon hunter. This is mostly for the fun after all, and something tells me I'm going to need the ability to parkour. So I set out. The goal was to complete the main campaigns, all the sojourn, the side quest achievements, and the renowned quest lines. I don't have any particular rules on what I could or couldn't use. The idea was to mimic the experience of past expansions where flying was unavailable from the start. So anything goes aside from the use of flying mounts. If a quest gave me an NPC mount to ride, then I'd use it. Flight paths were also allowed. I don't think there needs to be much said about the first portion of the Waking Shore. Everyone who has played Dragonflight did it, and everyone did it ground only. You kill some mobs, you follow the road. You kill some more mobs, you climb the tower. You kill some more mobs, you follow the road. Grab the egg! Get it! For the flight! You get a lift up to the Ruby Life Shrine, and this is where you get your Drake and a set of tutorial quests to go with it. Fun fact, it doesn't matter if you're on the Drake or not. As long as you can pass through the rings, it counts. The first quest was easy enough with Demon Hunter abilities, but the second required the use of a Golem Glider and a bit of parkour to reach the end. The third quest was where the problem started, since you had to rapidly lose height in order to get the first four rings. I thought that I might be able just to take the ferry back up and get the last ring with the added height, but the tracker reset upon reaching the top. I tried searching for a way to climb to the top of the pillar, but it seemed impossible. So I went to the bridge and pulled up my Darkmoon Cannon. With it, I was easily able to reach the ring, but found myself unable to reach the final platform. With a half hour cooldown on the cannon, I had to think of something else. I started to head back to the ferry, but then it occurred to me that it's possible that the quest counter resetting might not necessarily be from reaching the starting platform, but instead the method of which I got up there. I headed towards the nearest flight master to test the theory. Upon arrival, I found that I was right. My progress wasn't reset. However, it could have been that there was a flag near the launch point that did the resetting instead, so I launched myself a bit to the right to avoid it. The next quest is where I encountered my first insurmountable hurdle. I did briefly attempt it by first trying to find a higher launch point and then deciding to do the side quest while I waited for the cannon's cooldown. Unfortunately, even with the cannon, the rings were all too high and at an even level so I couldn't glide between them. Theoretically, it could be possible if I waited for the cannon cooldown for every single ring, but I'm doing this challenge for fun and I didn't want to wait several hours. So instead, I just got on my drake and did it normally. And while on my drake, I kind of realized that I think it would have just been impossible anyways. So yeah. I didn't even try the race without the drake. Like all the dragon races, if you take too long between every ring, it will just teleport you back to the start. If someone does somehow manage to do the race Drakeless, I'd love to see it. So far, that's two quests where I had to fly. At least some of you are probably wondering why. Why am I putting myself through this? Isn't flying just better? Why burn myself for being slow and having to deal with obstacles? Why do I find this fun? Well, let me tell you a story. The year was, um, Vanilla Wow. I was 12-ish. I had just been introduced to this game and was in the process of leveling my first tune, a night elf. Which I'm pretty sure was my druid that I made to this day. But for the purposes of this video, I'm going to substitute this night elf hunter I made on the Season of Discovery servers in order to tell this tale. So, 
I was having fun questing in Night Elf Land, but my friend at school, the one who introduced me to WoW, she was like, screw, screw Night Elf questing, come to Stormin, it's where all the good quests are, we can quest together. I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, this was like 18 years ago, probably like 20 by now. And I was like, okay, how do I get to Stormwind? And she's like, you take the boat. The boat takes you to the other continent, and then you follow the road. It's pretty dangerous, but you keep going, and eventually you reach Ironforge. Anyways, I'll be gone for the weekend. See you in Stormwind. Bye. So I got home from school and set out. I got on the boat and followed the road, through the swamp, past all the elf-eating crocs, up the steep slope along the sheer cliffs, past the orc ambush, yeah, this is a lot more dangerous in vanilla. Through the tunnel. Out of the tunnel into Loch Modon. Here the road splits. To the west and south. I head west to Ironforge, enjoying the beautiful snowy scenery as I go. I approach the gates, admiring the grand dwarvish architecture as I enter the city. Unlike the cold exterior, Ironforge is a warm, homely city, carved from the mountain and heated by pits of magma from deep below. Bustling and filled of many adventures, ripe for the exploration. But exploration could wait. My friend had given me a task, and I wanted to see it through, so I grabbed the flight path and headed out the front gate, south, towards Stormwind. I headed south until I hit the mountains, and then ran along them for a while, even entering Cold Ridge, but no matter how hard I looked, I just couldn't find the path that I needed to take to get me farther south. It was then that I remembered the branching road to Loch Modon, so I headed east back to the loch, taking the southern fork. I thought I had found a way but soon found my path blocked again by a gate that I had no key for, and the dwarf lady was not keen on letting me through. I headed up to Felsmar to grab the flight path, and then check my map. That's when I noticed it. You see, many portions of the map are hidden until explored. However, these hidden sections aren't completely without information. You can still see the mountain ranges that bind the zone, and with them, the gaps between the mountains that mark the passes. I headed southeast. I think it was the first five minutes of corpse running in Badlands that my little 12 year old brain was like, hey, this, this probably isn't the intended route. There has to be an easier way than this. But at this point, I was committed. I kept going all the way through Badlands, past the hungry coyotes, past the predatory cats, past the surprisingly fast horde guards until I hit Searing Gorge. Checking my map, I could tell that I somehow made it through Searing Gorge and into the Burning Steps I could make it to the human lands, to Stormwind. But there was a problem. I couldn't find the gap between the mountains between Searing Gorge and Burning Steeps. Surely it was there, somewhere. I searched for a while, back and forth. Little did I know that the entrance I seeked was in the exact opposite place where I wanted it to be, far to the west, through the tunnel, that if I had found it, would have forced me to run the complete length of the Burning Steps. But at this point, I had grown weary. The frustration got to me. I hearthed back to Darnassus and logged off for the night. The next day, I was ready to go again. Not the same route, mind you. The first handle worked out, I had to find another. I went back to Menethil Harbour and, being curious, hopped onto the boat to Theramore. Once in Duswallow Marsh, I swam north, braving the various dangerous sea creatures and the slimy murlocs to reach the boat and Ratchet. If you are wondering how exactly I knew about the boat and Ratchet, I have no idea. It was nearly 20 years ago. It might have been possible to spot the boat coming to Ratchet while riding the Theramore boat in Menethil if the timing was right, but I'm not really sure if they actually sailed close enough together for me to be able to have seen it. My other theory was that I had made a horde alt at some point and found the path that led to Ratchet and spotted the boat that way. Or I might have just simply googled WOW boat routes. Whatever it was, my night elf self was currently heading towards it in the hopes of finding a way to get to Stormwind. I found myself in Booty Bay, this time to the self of Stormwind. I found the exit nosed the road leading north, and began my journey for a second time. Past the pyroblasting pirates. Past the galloping gorilla. Past the... I did not make it past the high-level rogue who ganked me and proceeded to corpse camp me. Did I mention I was playing on a PvP server? Mobs were one thing. I could play around pathing routes and dumb computer AI. But other players? At this point, I just gave up. And the next day at school, I asked my friend, how the heck was I supposed to get from Ironforge to Stormwind? At which point, she informed me that apparently this fantasy game has an intercity subway system. Wow, who would have thought? So what's the point of this story? You see, even though the experience at the time was extremely frustrating, and in the end I didn't really accomplish anything, I still look back on it fondly to this day. Frustration aside, I had fun. 
I had fun trying to solve the puzzle of trying to get from point A to point B, and although it didn't work out at the time, when I finally got to a high enough level to explore Searing Gorge properly, I felt extremely vindicated finally finding that tunnel for Black Rock Mountain and learning that my attempted route that I had hashed together with barely a, any game knowledge could have actually worked. If only I had found that tunnel. There is something fun about doing things the wrong way, getting into places that developers didn't intend you to be. High level zones, while low level aside, I did a ton of exploring in places that weren't supposed to be accessible to anyone. Under Stormwind, atop Mount Hyjal, the Caverns of Time before they opened in Burning Crusade, the strange flat area of weird triangular cliff faces that I think was where present-day Oldham is located. There is fun in problem solving. For some, this might mean theory crafting the optimal way to play one's class and to achieve peak performance in PvE or PvP. For others, it might be trying to find the best way to level a character as fast as possible, or even become the very best like no one ever was through pet battling. For me, I like to navigate. I like to observe the environment. I like to find the hidden path, both intended by the developers and not. It's surprising what you can find if you know what to look for. The environmental devs put a lot of work into making their zones navigable, and I feel like they don't always get enough appreciation for it. Mastery, that is developing your skill to be truly good at something, is fun. Everyone chooses a different goal and approaches their chosen goal differently, but in the end, it's all a pursuit for mastery, and through it, a sense of fulfillment. And really, that's what this video is truly about. Appreciating zone design from the point of view of a land navigator who sees it as something to master and not as an obstacle to get to the true end game, as well as taking a look at how the devs choose to design zones in order to steer certain player behaviors and trying to spot things that work well and maybe some things that don't. To be clear, I'm not looking down on people who prefer to fly. I'm also not advocating for the return of Pathfinder. As I've said, each person has their own idea of what they want to do in this game, and for a good portion of a player base, that doesn't involve the science of getting from point A to point B. I just want to share some insight on something that I enjoy about this game, and point out some things that people often overlook. Since I'm talking about vanilla adventures, I think this is a good place to talk about vanilla zone design and zone design in general. Your most basic zone is what I would like to call a flat zone. This doesn't necessarily mean the zone is literally flat, just that you can mostly traverse it in any direction with no or few barriers. Getting from point A to point B is very straightforward. Examples include zones like Elwyn Forest, Ungaro Crater, and Tanaris. This isn't to say that these zones are completely without any kind of feature. For example, the Elwyn Forest has the Fargo Deep Mine, whose entrance is easily approached, being at the bottom of a dip in the land, but only has a few ways of leaving due to cliff faces. On the other end of the scale, Ungoro Crater has a volcano in the middle which can only be scaled via a certain path, but can be easily descended in any manner assuming you have a way of surviving the fall. I call these types of features bowls and cones respectfully, as they are defined by their ease of direction of travel. A bowl center can be easily approached by many if not all directions, but you can often only leave by a few selected paths, whereas a cone is the opposite, where you can only get to the center via one or two paths, but can leave it in almost any direction. Another common feature are canyons, which are narrow stretches of terrain that have only one or two points of entry and limit the player's movement with sheer cliffs on either side. Canyons can even double as a type of bowl terrain if the player can easily enter from above. Examples of both kinds can be found in Durotar. They are often used to hinder the player's movements and make fighting mobs more dangerous as it becomes more difficult to run to safety. And since I keep mentioning cliffs, I should probably talk about cliffs. Cliffs allow you to travel in one direction and one direction only. They can be short or tall, just a minor inconvenience or an impassable barrier. They are used as the building blocks for bowls, cones, and canyons, but can also be their own major feature, usually in cases where the one direction they allow you to go is not a direction you actually want to go. Probably the biggest terrain feature of all are what I like to call the zone walls. These are the mounds and cliffs used to mark the edges of the zones and keep the players from wandering out and getting into trouble before they are ready, as well as seeing things they probably aren't supposed to see. Not every zone has a zone wall between them. Elwyn Forest, Westfall, and Duskwood use a river as a boundary, for example. However, those that do tend to only have one or two gaps letting adventurers traverse to the next zone over. Sometimes these gaps can be hidden. How many of you watching know about the paths between hinterlands and western plaguelands, for example? These features are the major building blocks of a zone. However, there are many minor features as well that should be considered. Roads connect important points of interest and help to guide players to their destination. There will often be signs at the forks of roads, which can help point players in the right direction, and roads in general are fairly safe and tend not to have nearby aggressive mobs on them. 
This, of course, is ripe for a little bit of dev trolling, as there are multiple cases of Blizz putting dangerous mobs either walking along the road, infamously with stitches, or occasionally patrolling across the road, like that group of elite alliance NPCs in the Barrens. My favorite type of road, however, are the smaller, less noticeable ones. The ones whose existence you can only detect by a precisely placed torch that marks their beginning, or a slightly different texture. Otherwise, they'd blend in completely with the surroundings. By noticing them, you are rewarded with their use. In Stone Tollen Mountains, there is one of these paths just north of Sunrock Retreat, which Alliance players can use to cut across the mountains. The Cataclysm map of the zone actually points it out, but it is there in Classic too. Likewise, the small roundabout road leading Alliance players around Cat Mojachi and Ferilla's is probably one of my favorite paths by being the very definition of scenic route. Bridges or tunnels allow you passage over and through barriers. My favorite in Vanilla, which is a combination of the two, is, of course, the Great Cavern of the Black Rock Mountain. This acts as a tunnel connecting Searing Gorge and Burning Steps, as well as containing the giant chains used as bridges to get to the various dungeons and raids in the area. Water is interesting, because you can pass through it in any direction easily enough, but most people don't actually want to do that, as it's slow and often filled with dangerous enemies who can swim way faster than you. Back in Vanilla, it would even cause you to dismount as soon as you go into deep enough water, which is annoying. Because of this, when people traversed areas with lots of water, like wetlands, Deswallow Marsh, and Ungoro Crater, people back in the day would often memorize the best routes to get through various fens and marshes as quickly as possible, which often involved figuring out where one could leap over narrow gaps of water, while also not going completely out of their way. While I don't really play gnome characters, I have heard that they got the short end of the stick. Another interesting thing about water is that it can easily move in the third dimension, something I will talk a lot about later. The main downside to this is, of course, drowning. And lest we forget, water's spicier cousin, lava, which is less of a hindrance and more of a punishment for screwing up, but has a rather silly counterplay of jumping at precisely the right moment in order to dodge the damage ticks. And lastly, mobs. While mobs aren't what I would typically call a feature of the environment, they do play a role in determining what kind of path you take through an area. Of course, you can always take a risk and run through a camp of them in order to get from point A to point B faster, but unless you are bulky or agile enough, this can result in your untimely demise. Back in Vanilla, unless you greatly outlevel the mobs in the area, running through a camp of them was often suicidal, so planning a path around them was preferred. But that's enough discussion of old zones for now. Let's get back to Dragonflight. After doing the tutorial, I return to ground only. They do fly you up at one point and put you on your drake automatically, but I just hopped off and glided down to finish up the side quests. One of these side quests actually want you to go through it on foot and puts lots of tornadoes in your way. But fun fact, these tornadoes only throw you backwards, so you can just go through the course in reverse to easily complete it. Also, while I had done this quest chain earlier, I did want to point out this very one interesting tidbit of design over in the wetlands. The area is built up of many tall spires, interlaced with bridges and ramps. You can find one of the ramps to take you up to the wind gorlocks, but here you see a circle with some swirly air. Right next to it is a gorlock, who proceeds to walk into it and shoots up to the level above. Trying it yourself, you too will find yourself shot up to the top. It is a shortcut taught to you by observing gorlocks. I love little environmental teaching moments like that. I just wish these wind circles were actually used in more places. After dealing with all those side quests, I continue with the main campaign. It's mostly just fighting mobs, so nothing too interesting. However, I did notice this vignette mob off to the side, and found that to reach him I had to go through a narrow path with hazards in the way. Not only that, but I had found another path and a bridge that led all the way to the Onaran Plains. These are the cool little landscape designs that I love to find, and I would have likely completely missed it if I had just flown. After Alex Draza's fight with Razagith, I decided to do some more side quests before I went to go babysit Rathian. Most of these quests are quite doable with a ground mount, but there was one quest that I knew was going to be a problem. The quest to collect the sunlight flowers. Most of these flowers are found high up on ledges, some more easily reached than others. And unlike regular herbs, I do not believe these respawn when looted, so I can't just sit and wait at one location. I have to get all five of them. I went for the easy to reach ones first. Using my demon hunter abilities to clamber up a short cliff with rocky ledges and tree roots, I grabbed the first one, and then simply fell rushed over to the next platform to grab the second. The other three would be more tricky. After failing to find a way to get up to the other flowers, I went over to the explorer dig site to progress on some of the other side quests. It was here that I remembered about this, the spring. The spring doesn't do anything unless you're on the right quest, so I quickly went about murdering Primeless until I could use it. With this added height, I was easily able to reach flowers 3 and 4. 
Flower 5 was going to prove the hardest. My first attempt had me use the cannon and glider only to find myself just short. Not really wanting to wait the full half hour to try again with the cannon, I decided to look for a different launch point. I ended up traveling all the way up to the Onoran Plains, where I used the cliff's added height in order to reach the final flower. With the Dragon Scale Expedition quest out of the way, I named the well Bob, I headed off to the Obsidian Bulwark to see what kind of trouble Rathian had gotten himself into. He tasked me with showing his followers how much of a badass I was. I easily took out several of them at once. I easily took out several of them at once. Please ignore the level 70 Pally, he doesn't exist. After my flawless victory against Rathian's agents, I glide over to the Burning Ascent and start doing my best to rid the Jardin of their pottery and flags. Once that is done, the main assault begins. Who are you? Sibelian. The Burning Crusade was WoW's first expansion, and the expansion that introduced flying. You didn't get it immediately, you had to wait until max level, or 68 if you were a druid. Unlike Dragonflying, which operates with gravity in mind, where going up will slow you down and going down will speed you up, the original version of flying worked exactly the same as swimming, but in the air. You had complete control of your movement on all axes, could hover indefinitely whenever, and when moving your speed was always the same. Even back then, you could tell that Blizz was wary of introducing flying to the game. Unlike today, the first flying mount you got was a slow 60% increased speed, which still gave you a reason to use your epic land mount. To fly faster, you had to pay a whopping 5,000 gold, which was a huge sum back then. Blizz was also aware that being able to fly over all forms of danger would be a problem in terms of game design and environmental interaction, so they introduced deadly obstacles like the cannons in Blade's Edge that would attempt to shoot you down, and the infamous monstrous Kalari that patrol the skies over Skedis. Their intent behind flying at the time seemed to be that they wanted you to stick to the ground as much as possible, and only use flying to get to places that were unreachable by land, or as a shortcut where running around an obstacle would be slower. At least until you acquired enough gold to obtain your epic flying mount, which rewarded you with the ability to not have to worry about such trivial things. So let's have a look at some BC zones, and how they were designed to facilitate the interplay between ground and air travel. I won't be covering all the zones, just three of particular interest. When you first enter Nagrand, you are presented with a fast rolling plain, dotted with trees and small but steep hills. Sky islands float above, tantalizing you with their very presence, daring you to come perch upon them. As you approach Telar, you come across what, in my opinion, makes the zone truly interesting to navigate, the large canyons and bowls that cleave the land. There are plenty of bridges to cross them with, but if you have business at the bottom or just happen to fall in by accident, your only way out is to find one of the many narrow paths up the steep cliff sides. If there was no bridge, and you did not want to go to the bottom and find your way up the other side, you could always go around, but this isn't as much of an issue as you would think, as all the points of interest and roads between them are actually relatively straight. For example, going from Garadar to Forge Camp Haid is actually very straightforward. You just walk off the path, down the ravine, go up the ramp on the other side. Coming back is also no issue, as there is another ramp that leads almost directly from the bottom to the road. Similarly, Garadar to Oshigan is also extremely straightforward, due to the two well-placed ramps. It feels as if the devs back in the day wanted a land that looked like it had been damaged by some great cataclysm, but also wanted a friendlier zone. And so they dotted the land with many crags and cliffs, but also gave you plenty of ways to make traversing them easy. One important feature in Negran, the town of Hala, acts as a crossroads in the largest basin in the middle of the map. The gimmick is that this is a PvP area, where only one faction can control it at a time. Not really much of an issue nowadays, but back then, when BC was current, running for the town when it was controlled by the opposite faction wasn't really a good idea. Even then, if you wanted to pass around that way, the water is shallow around the edges and there are plenty of ramps in and out, meaning it's not that much faster to go through Hala than the alternative. Of course, it seems silly to talk about land travel when you could just fly around Nagran these days, but as I said earlier, back when basic flying was 40% slower than your epic land mount, and until you actually saved up for your epic flying mount, you would be traveling by ground a lot if you wanted to get anywhere fast. Where flying came in handy was jumping gaps and taking shortcuts, and of course reaching those tantalizing sky islands. I even have some screenshots from way back in the day where I flew alongside my groundbound friend. I don't know if she knew it, but I was actually testing the speed of a ground mount against my ability to fly straight as the storm crow flies. Unlike the relatively safe and clear road leading into Negran, the paths into Blades Edge Mountain are tight tunnels filled with angry spiders. When you get out on the other side, you are presented with a lot of spikes and a plateau. 
The best way to describe Blade's Edge is that it's a zone built from four layers. At the bottom, you have the huge canyon called Blood Mall Ravine that runs north to south through the middle of the zone. Then you have the more green areas and Death's Door, making up the second level. On the third level is the Bladed Gulch, another long stretch running parallel to the bottom level. And at the top, you have Ogri La and the Crystal Spine, two areas only accessible by flying. Linking all these levels together is a series of ramps, bridges, and tunnels. Unlike Nagran, these links between the subzones are not as generously given. Getting from point A to point B takes a bit more planning. It's this zone that I want to bring up the topic of 3D-ness, which is something I will mention throughout this video, so I feel like I should define it now. To me, the 3D-ness of a zone doesn't depend so much on its actual altitude within the zone, but more based on the decision making in terms of navigating the height differences. For example, if you follow a road and the road branches, one path goes up the cliffside and the other down, and you aren't sure which one to take, it's usually a better decision to take the high road since it's much easier to go down from high up than it is to scale a steep cliff. Though this decision is presented to you and you take the height difference into consideration is what I consider a zone having 3D-ness. This is also why I consider areas where you can move freely about in all directions flat areas, even if they are sloped and hilly. Blades Edge has a type of 3D-ness where the roads cross each other but on different height values so you can't actually easily switch from one road to another. If you're at the bottom layer in the Blood Mall Ravine, you cannot easily access the bridges that cross above you that lead to the second level. You would have to go find one of the ramps that lead up to the second level first and then cross the bridge. Although the ramps are often close to the bridges, so this isn't too much of an issue unless you're trying to get to the Ravenswood from the ravine. Likewise, if you're wearing Death's Door and wanted to get to the third level, you would have to go for the tunnels and then find a ramp that leads you up to the third level. On the other hand, going down is much easier, assuming you can survive the fall, which is actually where all these spikes come in handy. They make for a great way to turn a long drop into several shorter ones. So you could simply drop down into the ravine, run across it to the ramp nearest to your final destination, and continue from there. This, of course, was something only required of you until you obtained flying. When I first played BC, way back in the day, and I reached level 68 and got my flight form, Blades Edge was the first zone I really flew around in. 3 d doesn't just have to be for ground travel, and this zone really felt like it was designed around the idea of using flight to quickly ascend or descend between the levels. Flight form especially allowed for some daring dives to quickly get to the bottom, and the spikes that covered the zone were also something I could interact with by flying around and perching on. Sometimes I just want to sit on things. Nether Storm was probably my favorite zone in BC, not only with its alien appearance and eco-domes, but the very design of it is not something we have ever seen before or have seen since. To get into Nether Storm by land, you cross a bridge. There's nothing below the bridge. It is just void. They even have a lovely grate for you to peer through to confirm that the only thing keeping you from a very, very long drop was made by goblins. Nagran may have a few measly sky islands floating around, but Nether Storm is a zone composed entirely of floating islands covered in crags, cliffs, and ravines, and linked together with a few scant bridges. Until you're able to fly, these bridges are your only means of traveling between islands. It's a very similar idea to Blade's Edge, just more horizontal than vertical, and with no road overlaps. Probably the most notable features of Nether Storm are the Mana Forges and the Ecodomes. The Mana Forges are often surrounded by cliffs limiting how you can approach and are filled with mobs. Trying to quest here solo back in the day was an exercise in planning and patience, and hoping the mobs behind you hadn't respond when you inevitably pulled too much and had to flee. The Ecodomes, on the other hand, are a lot less hostile and quite a bit easier to navigate. Well, aside from Ecodome Farfield, which is very cliffy and teeters on the edge of the void. Seeing as this is a high-level zone, there are some areas that are flying only. Sakrathor Seat, Tempest Keep, and the three surrounding dungeons, and of course, these big floating rocks you see everywhere, although some of them are fake rocks of no mass that you can only fly through. Let me sit on you. Nether Storm has a different kind of 3 d than Blade's Edge. In Blade's Edge, the height difference comes into play only when traveling between sub-areas, whereas in Nether Storm, most of the 3D-ness is in the craggy terrain within each sub-area, and traveling between sub-areas can be seen as seeking out a door in an otherwise impassable wall until you hit level 70 and get flying and suddenly all those impassable walls melt away. Back to the present. Luckily for me, Rathian is super clingy and personally flies me up to all the high places, making the Obsidian Citadel completely doable without a flying mount. Once you've completed the questline, there's even a convenient ferry at the bottom to take you up if need be. The rest of the zone is pretty straightforward and unremarkable, 
I escorted the two man children in their car until it got fried, witnessed the return of the black dragon eggs, and then did the final side quest, ending with me telling a small child that their hero figure was dead. With the waking shore done, it was time for me to move on to the next zone. The on azure span. I, I wanted a way to segue into raft zones. The azure span is a large zone with a lot of flat areas interspersed with gigantic trees. Starting out, there aren't really any barriers beside this scroll I found, which let me live the true demon hunter experience. I also spent way too much time trying to find this book under Narelux, only to eventually figure out that the yellow dot on my minimap was Narelux himself. I picked up a bunch of side quests in Camp Antonidas, including a couple from our old pal Hemet Nezingwary. None of these required flying, although one had me run up the road to an icy plateau above to kill a frost giant. I just love finishing a quest and then goblin gliding off a cliff right after. Before going to help out Caligos, I stopped to help some Tusker with their boat problem. After proving myself the world's best whitewater fisherwoman, I found myself quite a distance from the Azure Archives, but the Tusker just teleported me back to the start, so I didn't have to walk all the way back there. The entrance to the Azure Archives is high above, but luckily for me the Blue Dragons were nice enough to put a pylon at the bottom of the cliff that transports me to the top. When I arrived, I noticed that there was a bunch of Blue Dragons around, who I'm pretty sure aren't supposed to be here yet in the story, but whatever. The questline eventually asked me to reach the top of the floating rings, which would be impossible if it were not for the items it gives you to transport yourself to the top. I'm unsure what would have happened if I had fallen off after handing in the quest. I didn't really want to check, so I was careful not to yeet myself off the edge of Felrush. Once done, it was an easy hop and glide to reach the bottom. After awakening Syndragosa, the quest leads me to the local flight master, who sends me back to Camp Antonidas. Before continuing on the main campaign, I finish out the side quests in the area. Of note is the Love Song side quest, which requires you to travel to the top of the tower, but conveniently the NPC transports you up. It's this quest and the Azure Archive quest that make me wonder if Dragonflight had originally been conceived without flying initially, like past expansions, and being able to fly from the start came later on in development. Going down the road, I came across Tuscar, who were beset by gnolls. The Knoll area doesn't really have anything notable about it in terms of land travel, just that I have to kill more gnolls than I otherwise would if I could fly. After defeating the gnolls and saving the souls of the dead Tuscar, I head down the road to Iskara. All the trees, rolling tundra fields, and icebergs are really nice to look at and remind me of zones from past expansions. In particular... Grizzly Hills. A favorite for many. It's got grizzlies, they got hills, it's got a log ride, and the world's biggest stump for the time. I'm not sure what else to say about it. It's not particularly hard to navigate. It's kind of a long, skinny zone, and while there's plenty of cliffs and rivers around, they aren't really getting in your way. It is a pleasant zone to be in, though, that's for sure. Wrath of the Lich King was WoW's second expansion, taking place in the icy lands of Northrend. Like Burning Crusade, it also restricted your ability to fly at first, forcing you to run until level 77, around the time you would reach Storm Peaks, which actually requires flying to complete. In fact, let's explore it, shall we? You enter Storm Peaks on a snowy path. To your right is a minefield. Continuing on, sitting lonely in the vast snowy plain at the base of the peak, is a small goblin town of K3. If you somehow manage to complete all the quests here without getting your cold weather flying ability, you cannot continue. So let's fly. Although this video is mainly about ground travel, I also want to cover zones that are built around flying. Storm Peaks is probably one of, if not the best zones that incorporates flying into its design. Its high peaks topped with temples invite you to ascend, and the various titan constructs keep you looking both up and down for more points of interest. This is in stark contrast to most other zones that allow flying, where you simply get as high as you need to to avoid the terrain and only ever look down. The mountains are of such height here that it is more time efficient to simply fly between them and around them than it is to get above them. Of course, that doesn't mean that Storm Peaks is completely devoid of any sort of design facilitating ground travel. As I mentioned earlier, basic flying used to be slow and wouldn't be sped up until 3.2 or so. For those who didn't yet have the 5k goal needed in order to fly fast, sometimes ground travel was the go-to. Out of curiosity, I flew up from the Snowblind Terrace to Sifraldur Village and tried to see how far I could go on foot. I figured out that excluding Ulduar and its related dungeons, Stormpeace can roughly be divided into four sections. The Snowblind Fields surrounding K3, the Sifraldur Village, Footsteps, Thunderfall, and Fields east of the Terrace, the Terrace of the Makers, Snowdrift Plains, and Valkyrion, 
And lastly, the various isolated areas that can only be reached by flying, but go nowhere else, such as the Temple of the Storms or Grommarsh Crash Site. Aside from the isolated areas, the other three sections can easily be traveled around on by foot within the particular section, but you will need a flying map to get between them. In this way, it is similar to Blade's Edge and Netherstorm, where flying was used to hop between sub-areas, but not as a main mode of travel. The final zone I want to talk about in Northrend is the Howling Fjord. As the name suggests, it is a zone of plenty of tall, sheer cliffs. Although the area at the top of the cliffs is fairly flat and easily traversed, it has a few sub-areas of high levels of 3D-ness. Starting from the Alliance town of Volgard, there are two ways up the cliffs. The first is a road leading out of the town itself that winds its way along the cliffside and reaches the top just west of Utgard Keep. The other way is a somewhat less noticeable path across the water that's marked by a torch that switchbacks up the east side of the fjord. If you continue to head east, you will come across Balgun's excavation site. A series of link platforms, caves, elevators, and angry rune doors make this area quite the adventure to ascend or descend, where you have to really look up and down to see where you want to go and plan how to get there. Heading north along the east coast, there are a lot more elevators that go from ocean level to the top, likely a place to help those unfortunate enough to fall off the cliff. One of these elevators serves Vengeance Landing, the Horde starting town. Heading even further north, there are two tall mountains. One of them is climbable, the other is not. This is going to come up later, but I much prefer my mountains to be climbable. The west side of the zone has two areas of note. The first is the Whispering Gulch, a deep crevasse, which can be navigated through a combination of ramps, bridges, and tunnels. I always really like this area. It looks like it's made out of several discrete levels, but they're all interconnected with tunnels and bridges. Even with all the deranged dwarves, it's fun to explore on foot, as well as fly through. The final thing of note is the ancient lift. I mean, look at this thing. Who needs to fly when you have a Viking Draken boat gondola to take you wherever you need? Assuming wherever you need is a homely Tuscar village. Back to Dragonflight's own homely Tuscar village, I help out with the funeral, and then go do all of the side quests around Ascara. Having the angler's water striders equipped to my mount was very handy. Also, I love me a good log bridge. None of the side quests proved to be any sort of challenge so far in terms of travel, although I did have a lot of fun gliding off of Three Falls Lookout. While doing the Monarch questline, I did know some interzone paths between the Azure Span and the Onoran Plains. After helping Caligos call back the blue dragons that were already there, the next quest wants me to ride a drake to the top of the Azure Archives. Luckily, this is optional, and I could just go to Ronin Shield by foot. I do the side quests in the area, and then continue on with the main campaign. Backthrow's range is just one big ramp. I actually found the quest objectives seemed to line up better when I ran, as flying often encouraged skipping mobs, and then I'd have to go back for them anyways. After fending up Razaguf, it's time to descend from Vakthros. It's obviously set up for you to fly down easily, but of course I just run, dodging all the angry elementals along the way. Speaking of elementals... Cataclysm brought great change to the world of Warcraft. Specifically, the old world that had been in the game since the very beginning. The entirety of the Eastern Kingdoms and Kalimdor were revamped for a whole new questing experience, as well as to allow flying. While this didn't affect those leveling from 1 to 60, as they couldn't actually fly until they reached level 60, it did greatly change how higher level players experienced the new expansion zones. For the first and only time until the release of Dragonflight, the player base could fly right from the start of the expansion. This proved to be an interesting experiment. While many players greatly enjoyed their newfound freedom, it led to frustration among the devs, as all their hard work designing zone layouts crumbled to dust as the player base decided to simply not interact with it. By adding flying right from the start, with the buffs and wrath that made it faster than ground travel even without epic flight, they had inadvertently turned every zone into, functionally, a flat zone. This led the devs to make a rather controversial decision sometime in the future, but I am getting ahead of myself. Let's explore some catazones. As mentioned earlier, all the way back in vanilla, I was a bit of an explorer, and one of the areas I explored was Mount Hyjal, which was an area that, while technically fully completed, minus the mobs, was inaccessible to the general player base unless you took a very specific path through Dark Whisper Gorge in Winter Spring and then jumped up a particular set of rocks and hills until you managed to get through the gap and into the zone. Judging by these early screenshots, I believed I first did this around level 30. Given Winter Spring was a high level zone, and Dark Whisper Gorge in particular was filled with a lot of nasty level 60 elites, there was likely a lot of corpse running involved. But once I managed to get into Hyjal, oh what a grand adventure I had. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to run for the Burning Crusade Raid version, as the layout is similar, just with a bunch of buildings that weren't there in the vanilla version. You start from the bottom, and wind your way up the mountain. The zone is empty. You are alone. 
The path at times is narrow and runs along the cliff sides. Occasionally there is a break in the wall where you can look out and appreciate the long, long drop to the lands below. Despite its emptiness, the views are spectacular and always leading you up, up and up and up. Eventually you see the boughs of the great tree looming above, and after just a bit more running, you crest the hill and see the full tree in its splendor, and at its root lies the skeletal remains of Archimonde, and a bit further on is a blizzard construction cosign. Cataclysm Hygel is different. While the tree is larger and the water glows, it lacks the giant skeleton that the original version had. But more importantly, unlike the original Hygel, you start from the top and work your way down. There's no buildup of eager anticipation as you climb the mountain to finally lay your eyes on the world tree so many died to protect. Instead, you start at the top and slowly descend down the mountain until you reach the smoky and desolate landscape of the twilight hammer-infested Dark Whisper Gorge. When I first quested through Hygel all the way back in Cataclysm, I had a lot of fun seeing how they had changed the zone, but a part of me sitting way at the back of my mind was always just a little bit disappointed. I feel that one thing that people don't consider is how navigation can affect your emotional reaction to a zone. The zone was open to all now, but in a way it had lost its magic, simply by the way we were presented it. Not helping was the flying. The old path, the one that I had climbed all those years past, was still there. In fact, aside from a few areas, basically all of Hyjal is accessible by foot. But it was useless. What had once been my guide up the mountain, my path to adventure, was now little more than window dressing. To this day, I wonder what would have happened if they had reversed the journey, even with flying available, started you out from the bottom and made you work your way to the top. Would it have been more enjoyable? Would it have made seeing the great tree for the first time more awe-inspiring? Or is this just a case of rose-tinted glasses affecting my view of a perfectly good zone? I do not think flying did Hyjal any justice, especially not combined with the descent. Mounds are made to be climbed, after all. Starting anywhere but the bottom just feels wrong. But what if you did have a zone designed around the very concept of descending? Not only that, but a zone that allows flying to such an extent they can do it all the time, everywhere, even while fighting. Vashir is a zone that is entirely underwater. It is a zone that the player base is extremely split upon. Either you love the zone, or you hate it. There is no in-between. Although the usual issue that plague water levels in video games, like not being able to breathe and slow movement speed, are solved within the first few quests of the zone. Vashir is a zone where the devs really played with the concept of 3D space. Quest objectives and mobs are no longer found on a single plane, but instead often inhabit different levels, making you navigate up, down, and around to complete quest objectives, and encouraging you to always keep your eyes above and below you. The zone itself is made up of three subzones, each reflecting the various depth zones found in real-world oceans, and divided with deep trenches that are easy to cross but still make you a bit uneasy, which adds to the overall atmosphere. The first subzone, Kelpthor Forest, is pretty basic and close to the surface, the kiddie pool of the ocean. The second subzone, the Shimmering Expanse, has the zone progressively get deeper, with huge coral-filled chasms, ancient multi-leveled nidal ruins, and this thing which you can go inside like some sort of Legend of Zelda Jabu Jabu dungeon. The last subzone, the Abyssal Depths, is the deepest part, filled with hydrothermal vents and dark waters with bioluminescent plants and animals. And at the very deepest part, in the Abyssal Breach, a great whirlpool that you can flush yourself down to reach this fun jellyfish-filled pool, also the Throne of Tides dungeon. Each of these subzones have different levels within themselves. Altogether, this creates an almost spiral staircase effect, where you progressively get deeper and deeper as you go through the story. You can always swim back, of course, but the way the zone is laid out, with the large drop-offs, it always feels that for every level you go down, it will become more of a struggle to reach the surface again. Unlike Hyjal, where going from the top to the bottom was, in my opinion, detrimental to the overall feeling of the zone, the downward progression in Vashir works a whole lot better. Of course, people do have problems navigating the zone. Our brains aren't really made for 3D environments like this, after all. So I'll give you two tips to help you out. Number one, if you have trouble finding a cave entrance, look for these yellow and purple tube worms. Number two, if you are having trouble with depth perception, then wiggle your camera back and forth. I learned this trick years ago while watching a documentary about squirrels. Oh yeah, and I discovered this while watching people head towards the Throne of Tides dungeon during Season 3, but if you have the sea legs buff from the quest line and get on your dragon riding mount and walk off a ledge, you can glide underwater. You won't be able to use any dragon riding abilities, but it's fun if you're only heading down. The final cataclysm zone I want to talk about is Deep Home. 
As I flew around it, taking notes, I realized that this was most definitely a zone designed around flying, but not really in a good way like Storm Peaks. If you need to go up or down, it's obvious. If there's a wall in front of you, you aim up. If there's not, then you aim downwards. It was basically just one huge wide open area of a series of plateaus and platforms that required flying to get to them, and that was it. It required little thought to traverse, as despite being a multi-leveled, there was little actual 3D-ness to it. There are no secret caves or tunnels halfway up the cliffside to watch out for. There are these huge pillars to fly around, but the zone is so open it barely matters. The few pieces of interesting terrain that I found, such as this rocky platform above the Needle Rock Chasm, had nothing on it despite looking like there should be something of interest here. It is a flat zone of a zone that is pretending to not be a flat plane. It requires little to no decision making to traverse. In other words, while very pretty to look at, it is boring to navigate. It is a real shame too, because if the zone had more ramps, bridges, and tunnels to link the various sub-areas together, it would have made for a marvelous no-flight zone. Just looking at these cliffs, I can easily see where paths could have been made to facilitate this type of gameplay. Unfortunately, this is a trend I often see with underground zones throughout WoW's history. Blizz is so afraid to add any kind of tight spaces to the game, they often go to the complete opposite end of the spectrum and just make an incredibly open zone with a ceiling, losing what makes caves unique in the first place. If you're going to make a cave zone, then make a cave zone. Speaking of areas not designed around ground travel, the Lost Rune side quests are where I found my next challenge. Not only does it require you to pass back and forth through a cave of spiders, but later on in the questline I had to kill an elemental on a high tower with no obvious way to get up. Situations like this are the main reason I decided to do this on a demon hunter, as I was able to use my abilities to parkour up the frozen waterfall and reach the quest mob. The rest of the side quests were easy, although the amount of running around you had to do for the Grim Tusk side quest, you can definitely tell this was made with your ability to fly in mind. I finished up the Azure Span, and it was time for the next zone, Thaldrasis. JK, actually this is where I'm going to cover Onaran Plains. What can I say about Onaran Plains? It's flat. It's a zone mostly inhabited by landbound centaurs, so it has to be to justify their existence. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. As much as I pray zones with high cliffs and twisting roads, I realize that sometimes one needs a break from them. Large flat zones act as an important contrast and help to diversify the landscapes. Although there was a general lack of obstacles throughout the zone, there was one time where my inability to fly really bit me in the butt. You dare to steal from my crucibles? I am coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think this must have been Firak's revenge for me getting ahead of the curve the previous day. Look at this absolute unit, the size of this lad, and so fluffy, the ultimate specimen. The green dragon area is where I thought there might be trouble. But it turned out there was plenty of ramps and bridges everywhere, and the one time I did need to go up to a high point to talk to an NPC, they gave me a ferry. I will say that running along the roads across the plains gave me some real classic Mulgore and Barrens vibes. Just lots of flat land and running. It took me approximately six minutes to run from the ancient bow to Pinewood Post along the road, in case you were wondering. I finished any side quests I missed, but I had to wait until 10.2.5 for follower dungeons to complete, Sojourner, since two of the quests required me to do the dungeon, and I didn't want to be the one person holding the group back by not flying. Also, does anyone else think that these necromancer centaurs are really cute with their whole you should fear who, those who control the dead bit? If only they knew what we were doing last expansion. All this green is pretty to look at. It reminds me of some verdant green zones from days long past. With the arrival of Mists of Pandaria, Blizz returned to their old ways of restricting flying until max level, which I'm sure annoyed a lot of people, but I didn't mind because Mists of Pandaria has some of the prettiest zones in the game that are enjoyable both from the ground and air. Although dotted with many high rocky spires, the Jade Forest is fairly easy to traverse, even if you don't follow the road. The southern landscape is fairly gentle, with plenty of gaps between the mountains. As you go farther north, the terrain becomes more cliffy, requiring you to either follow the path or keep an eye out for any unmarked routes. The inhabited areas around Tian Monastery in particular have many stairs and bridges crisscrossing the steep cliff sides. While leveling in Remix, I really took my time to appreciate the beauty of the zone. The shaded bamboo forests, grassy meadows, and beautiful flower fields are something I didn't realize I missed as much as I did. 
As usually when I visit the zone, I fly over the canopy to get to my destination faster. Kun Lai Summit starts out as a fairly flat foothill area, but as you head uphill, the terrain quickly becomes more mountainous, with the only way up is to follow the winding road. If you keep heading up, you will eventually come across Neverus Base Camp. Nearby is a path marked of rope and red flags. Following it, the way up the mountain increasingly becomes more and more treacherous, where one wrong step could potentially send you plummeting to your death. But once you do reach the top, you have an unobstructed view of the entire zone. A fine reward for a mountain climb. Oh yeah, and there's this balloon ride ferry in the Zhao Chin province, which I think is neat. However, as much as I like these zones, pretty much all of them suffer from a flaw that has been present ever since fast flying was made available. Or at least, I see it as a flaw. At max level, once you can fly, all this carefully laid out zone design becomes pointless. I don't need to go up the steep, treacherous path to get to the top of Mount Everest. I can just fly up there whenever I want. And what's the point in remembering all these passes and small paths in Jade Forest when I'll never need them again at max level? Because of this, an entire aspect of the game that the devs spent a lot of time on is lost. All that hard work making an engaging environment down the drain. I wonder how the devs felt about that. Well, they were probably a bit miffed, since the next two zones that were introduced to the game, the Isle of Thunder and the Timeless Isle, were made into no-fly zones. The story of the Isle of Thunder justified the no-flying by threatening us with lightning, but the Timeless Isle had no such justification. You simply can't. The Isle of Thunder isn't very big and fairly flat. The main obstacles are the walls and terraces of the various runes dotted around the zone, and the mobs, including some patrolling elite mobs. The Sorok area has a fun mechanic where you can get a Sorok disguise, which allows you to run around quickly, as well as leap great distances. This helps a lot when trying to navigate the cliffy area that would otherwise be inaccessible. Another way the devs tried to make the Isle of Thunder a bit more interactive was with the Chamberlain quest, where you have to pick up all the pieces of a statue. The pieces are scattered throughout the zone and are often in hard to reach places that require at least a little bit of parkour to obtain. The Timeless Isle has a much more interesting layout with its giant ramp that circles half the zone and a plateau at the top, which is only accessible by those who have obtained the legendary cloak back in the day or gone the upgraded cloak in Remix, or you can ride an albatross to the top, although unless you have the cloak you can't access the courtyard. When playing through Remix, I actually found the layout of the zone to be fairly frustrating, since getting up to the rares would take a lot of time and they often died as soon as they spawned. But back in the day, this was far less of an issue, since we weren't going around one-shotting everything. Entering Thaldrasis wasn't very straightforward. There was a giant chasm I needed to cross and the bridge was broken. Luckily, with a little bit of gliding, my Dark Moon Cannon had just enough range for me to make it across. From there, I just followed the road and made my way to Valdraken. Getting up to the seat of the Aspects was easy with the teleporter. After meeting with Alex Straza and the other Aspects, I base jumped down to the main courtyard and went about searching for information on rebels and primalists. This eventually led me to Selfhold Gate, which had plenty of stairs and bridges to help get around. Once the area had been cleared of primalists, I goblin glided off the highest point I could and headed back to Valdraken. Nosdormo sent me to the Shifting Sands. Following the road east, I came across a drop. The drop itself wasn't much of an issue, but this had me wondering if I could get back up without the use of flight paths. After a bit of exploring around Tearhold Reservoir, I found a path back up along the rebellious cliffs. Continuing on my journey, I came across the opposite problem, where the road ends abruptly and you're expected to fly up. Once again, after a bit of searching around, I found another path that led me up to where I wanted to go. There were some side quests here, but I wanted to finish the main campaign before I worked on them, so I grabbed the Flight Master and continued on to the Shifting Sands. I started helping out the Time Walker, but while trying to close the portal, an accident happened and I got sent back in time to... Iladari. This would have made a great segue into Legion. Warlords of Draenor, that one expansion built around the idea of alternate universe time travel because the devs wanted to bring back all the old orc chieftains and then put zero thought into any and all of the problems involved of alternate universe time travel. But hey, this isn't a lore video, it's a video talking about land travel, and oh boy did warlords bring back land travel in a big way. You see, ever since its introduction in the Burning Crusade, flying was always available as soon as you reached max level, or even before then. Warlords changed that. When Warlords was first introduced, there was no flying at max level. In fact, there was no flying at all. 
the zone design devs had finally had enough of people flying over all their hard work and decided to put a stop to that by simply not letting you fly. With flying out of the way, the devs were free to, um, well, zone design to their heart's content. And I actually think they did a really good job. Plenty of bridges, bridges and canyons, flat areas and paths between them, both the easy to spot kind and the secret variety. And the jumping puzzles. I love jumping puzzles. I think I need to especially shout out Northeastern Nagran, which at first glance looks extremely difficult to get around with all the cliffs and ridges, but the more you look, the more paths you find. Many paths can be found zigzagging up the cliff sides. What at first glance looks like an uncrossable gap is actually just small enough for you to leap across on a ground mount. See how these mushrooms line up to create a bridge from one side to the other, albeit one way? If you start up this path to snarl pole edge, but then look to your right, you will spot a gentle grassy slope. Heading up it actually leads you to the elemental plateau. Hey look, there's a cave over there. I wonder how to get to it. There doesn't seem to be a way up this side. Oh, a secret path. Oh look, some specially placed grass to indicate a climbable edge to reach a tree I could cut down if this was current content. And what's this I see across the way? A flag? A lot of flags. Just have to clear all these jumps. And oh look, at the steam weedle goblin glider to take me gently down to the plains below. There are a lot of goblin gliders placed around the zone, and some of them, when used properly, even lead to treasure. So yeah, big fan of Warlord zone design. Too bad there was like no point to it outside of leveling and treasure collecting achievements because there was basically no max level open world content. So during Warlords, as the months ticked by, people started wondering when Blizz was going to introduce flying, because unlike me, a lot of people don't really see zone navigation as fun, and are much happier getting to where they want to faster in order to play the parts of the game they actually want to play. Blizz, for the most part, was pretty cagey about the whole thing. It wasn't until an interview of Polygon that it was revealed that Blizzard actually had no plans of reintroducing flying, not to Warlords and not to any future expansions. Needless to say, the player base did not take this well, like I'm talking massive protests and unsubscriptions. So as a compromise, Blizz introduced the Pathfinder achievement. Basically a way of forcing you to do all the content they wanted you to do, as intended, by the devs, and then once you've completed everything, you were rewarded with the ability to fly. This model would be the go-to model for the next three expansions. Of course, these achievements were never available to do at the expansion launch, and players still had to wait one or two major patches in order to complete them and fly. But that was the compromise we had to live with. Back to the present. After helping to fix various timeways, I headed back, only for them to tell me to meet them at the top of the temporal conflicts and take off. You, you guys gonna give me a ride, guys? Guys? So began my journey on figuring out how to get on top of these platforms. I decided to go check out Aeon's Fringe, since I knew portions of it were high up. However, those higher up portions were inaccessible, so I had to find another way. Eventually, I found a scalable hill in the northeastern corner of the Shifting Sands, which gave me enough height to goblin glide over to the platform. Said hill also came in handy when I had to use it again in the Primalist future. The following quests are entirely land-based, so there's nothing to really say about them. Once done, I took the flight path back to Veldraken and headed up to the Seat of the Aspects to complete the main campaign, which unlocks the world quests. World quests... Actually, I want to finish up Sojourner before I talk about Legion. I started out with the spa quests. There were a few ramps going from the spa itself back up to the quest giver, so getting around wasn't an issue. Also, isn't this guy a dark ranger? Didn't he, like, commit war crimes while working with Sylvanas? I did the Misty Vale quest line next. There is a path up, and everything is in one area, so it was easy. I took a flight path over to Gelakir Overlook to do those quest lines. There is a winding staircase up the mountainside, so once again, no flying wasn't an issue. Similarly, the Drawing Conclusions questline was also very easy and posed no problem. The following two questlines were where things started to get tricky. Both the Screech Flight Scramble and the Bleeding Hearts questline started extremely high up and well out of reach of ground travel. Or were they? After a bit of exploring, I noticed the aqueduct high up in the sky, perhaps high enough to reach the quest givers if I could get on top of it. Going back up the passage of time, I used my demon hunter parkour skills in order to get on top of this rock. From here, I was able to glide down to this grassy overhang, where a path led up to the fishing area around Tearhold. From here, I simply had to squeeze through this small gap, and I was on top of the aqueduct. This put me at the perfect height to reach the Screech Flight area and do those quests. And lucky for me, when it came time to kill the Screech Flight matriarch, they gave me a rocket to get up to her cave. 
After finishing up, I backtracked and dropped down to the area below to do the Bleeding Heart quest line. Once done, I took the flight path over to the gardens. I wanted to leave the Tearhold Reservoir quest for last because I thought it might be a bit problematic and I also needed to wait for the Time Rift event to finish up. The garden area was not difficult at all. In Deerhold Reservoir, while the first quest was nice and easy at ground level, the following quest wanted me to go to each of these rooms halfway up the cliffside. This would have likely taken me a while to figure out, but as I had glided down to Deerhold Reservoir from the Gelliker Overpass, I had already figured out the solution. All I had to do was head up the path leading to Gelliker, and once high enough, just leap off and use the Golden Glider to reach the North Room. The East Room was even easier since you simply had to drop down, no glider needed. The only real issue was that this process was somewhat time consuming, but a completed quest is a completed quest. And with that done, I had finally completed Sojourner and the Lore Master of the Dragon Isles. Thank the Titans. The Titans. The Titans. Legion, like Warlords, restricted your access to flying from the very start. This time, the player base had the promise of an eventual Pathfinder achievement, but we wouldn't see it until many months and a few patches after the release of the expansion. Unlike Warlords, Legion had actual max level open world content in the form of world quests, which were like daily quests except spread around the map. This, combined with the whole having to constantly collect artifact power thing, actually gave players a reason to run around zones and use their navigational skills, which in turn allowed for proper skill expression as their knowledge of the landscape built up over time. Stormheim is probably one of my favorite zones to navigate in the game because it really encapsulates what I find fun about land travel, a puzzle to be solved. And once solved, the seemingly inhospitable landscape becomes just as easy to traverse as any other zone. It is extremely rugged, split through the middle by a huge fjord with sheer cliffs. The rocky and steep terrain is as intimidating as the Reichel who call it home, but just as the Reichel can be felled and conquered, so too can Stormheim. The mountainous slopes leading up to Nostrander are actually covered in a web of grassy paths. The seemingly inescapable fjord actually has many sloping trails interspersed along the cliffside to lead you out. And on occasion, if you picked up a grapple launcher at some point in your explorations, you may find a series of grappling points that let you cross broken bridges or lead you to points of interest that you otherwise couldn't reach. High Mountain is much the same, although if I had to differentiate it from Stormheim, I would describe it as smoother but with thicker walls. While Stormheim was more of a series of cliffs and canyons crisscrossed by paths, High Mountain is an amalgamation of cones and bowls. Each sub in and of itself is rather flat but where High Mound becomes interesting is in the traversal between the sub-areas. I think when High Mound was current, it frustrated a lot of people. To them, getting between one area and another was a huge chore, as you had to go through all these roundabout ways to get around all the cliffs. But if you look carefully, there are actually a ton of hard-to-see paths that act as shortcuts, usually marked with a torch or even a bit of texture. Just try not to trip and fall to your death. This isn't to say that these paths make the zone flat, however. It is very mountainous, and many potential paths I spotted turn out to be either dead ends or one way. Going from Pine Rock Basin to Bloodhunt Highlands, you do need to either go up the river by True Shot Lodge, or go through one of the two caves going through the Hagland Ridge. You can go over the mountains in the reverse direction, but unless you have business at the top or a goblin glider, it's probably faster just to go through the caves again. Roads exist for a reason, after all. The crown jewel of High Mountain is the High Mountain itself, a climb that puts Neverus Peak and Kung Lai to shame. Although it's not nearly as dangerous and the path is marked, there isn't really a reason to climb to the top, but sometimes you just feel like climbing a mountain, you know? Valshura and Azuna are both pretty basic zones, flattish with lots of small cliffs and ridges, but not particularly hard to navigate. Although I will never forgive the dev who decided to make the Druid mission board impossible to perch on. Let me sit on you! So for those of you who haven't played Legion, especially when it was current, here's the gimmick around Suramar. You are in a city. The city is hostile to you. There are mobs everywhere. You have a disguise. Some of these mobs can see through the disguise. Cities are not natural landscapes and tend to be very maze-like. Suramar is no exception. Although luckily, due to game scale, it isn't too bad to learn to get around. The real fun comes from navigating between all the mobs while trying to complete whatever objective you have in the area. Some of the areas within the city even have elite mobs which you do not want to get the attention of unless you are prepared. To avoid detection, you need to move carefully and quickly, and be aware of any patrols in the area that might break your disguise when you least expect it. It's basically just one giant stealth mission. Surmar City is a zone that is looked at fondly on by the player base as a whole. 
There were, of course, some people who hated it due to the stress involved in having to constantly pay attention to what was happening around them and were happy to be able to fly over it once flying was available. But I do think Surumar is a great example of how limitations on movement can be used to excellent effect, both in creating gameplay challenges and immersion into the story. The last zone I want to talk about is Argus, technically split into three separate zub zones like Vashir. All three areas are no-flight zones. The first area, Krokun, isn't that hard to get around. There are plenty of roads, and aside from a patrolling fell reaver, not a lot of dangerous mobs to get in your way. The Antorin Waste, on the other hand, is much more hostile, with a rugged jagged landscape, lava pools, and aggressive mobs everywhere. That being said, I also didn't find this area that hard to navigate. The jagged rocks are easy to run along, and sort of act like the road of the zone if you are able to parkour across the gaps. And if you were able to obtain the sightless eye toy, it made it easier to navigate around the mobs. The last area, Aerodeath, is probably the least hostile of the bunch. It is very flat, and the density of mobs is such that you can just walk around them for the most part. I do have to give a shout out to this one hole though, for it has claimed countless lives. Like Surumar, the layouts and obstacles of each subzone really adds to the immersion. Aerodeath is broken off into the sky and far off from the Legion, so it makes sense for it to be the least hostile. Likewise, Antoran Waste is the most demon-infested Legion-controlled area, so it's the hardest to get around. Krakoon is in that in-between state of being only partially controlled by the Legion, and so it reflects that by being right in the middle in terms of navigation. Also, since I'm here, I really, really have to give a shout out to these skyboxes. Look at these skyboxes. These are probably the best skyboxes in the game. I think one of my favorite things about them, other than watching Azeroth slowly turn in the sky, is how you can actually see the other subzones far off in the distance. This really gives a sense of scale to the world of Argus that would otherwise be lost by the small zone sizes. So with the main campaign done, it was time for the renowned campaigns. I started with the sealed door from the Dragon Scale Expedition. Getting there was easy enough. There was a path starting at Tearhold Reservoir that switched back up the cliffside all the way up to the door. After talking to two explorers, I glided back to Veldraken to talk to Koranos. He sent me to the library, where I got assaulted by some strange yellow gecko who stole my book and ran off after I deleted half his health bar in one move. Getting back to the door was fun. I went all the way up to the seat of the Aspex and goblin glided off. If there's one thing I like about Thaldrasses, it's that it's fun to goblin glide around. After talking to the two explorers again, they sent me to three different locations. I decided to go to the Veiled Ossuary first, since it was the closest. I first glided over to Algathar Court to grab the flight path and then made my way north, following the various paths littered around the place. I was curious how much Algathar Academy was accessible from the ground and was surprised to find that you can get to most of it, including the dungeon entrance. However, there is still a good chunk of it higher up and out of reach. I scouted around for what I thought was the best place to start gliding from and took off in an attempt to reach the Veiled Ossuary. I knew the entrance was high up and I wasn't sure if there was a way to get up if I didn't make it. I didn't quite make it, so I had to use my Demon Hunter parkour abilities to get me up and grab the flight path. On a later date, while on my druid, out of curiosity I did try to see if I could make it from the seat of the Aspects. I found that I could almost make it on the glider alone, but it runs out just short, and another form of slow fall is needed to get the rest of the way. A more reliable method was to land on the Azerothian Archive Island, and then wait for the cooldown and glide the rest of the way. Once in the Veiled Ossuary, the questline itself was pretty straightforward with no flying required. Likewise, the other two quests in the Azure Span and Onaran Plains were also very easy, although the Azure Span portion did require me to climb up the nearby ridge in order to reach the top of the tower. With all three quests done, I returned to the base camp. The next portion of the Renown campaign is barely worth mentioning since it's just going back to the sealed door, opening said door, doing some indoor stuff, and then going back to the base camp for the final hand-in. I did, however, get a sneak peek into the future where Sargeras returns after his training arc of Lord Illidan. I also decided to try to glide from the Titan facility to the Dragonscale Expedition Camp. Didn't quite make it, though. The next renowned questline I decided to do was the Chieftain's Duty, associated with the Iskara Tuskar rep. It started out in Iskara, and then I had to take the flight path all the way to the Waking Shore. There isn't really much to say about this questline, it is entirely land accessible. I did take the time to appreciate the layout of the Waking Shore though. I like how the river winds through the zone, acting as one large throughway with a network of bridges and paths sprawling along, across, and out from it that direct you around the tall mounds and spires dotted around the zone. Next was the Silver Purpose. I returned to the seat of the Aspects and pretended to listen to Alexstrasza talk about some guy named Tyr. 
who I guess some time in the past died from his wounds. Okay, this was a stupid segue. Like Legion before it, Battles for Azeroth was yet another expansion that restricted flying until about halfway through when its version of Pathfinder was released. And like Legion, the presence of world quests and barred power grind made traversing around something that everyone had to do. If I had one word to describe Kul Tiras, it would be mountainous. The lowlands themselves tend to be very flat, if a bit hilly, with small, easily scalable ledges. But each of the three zones that make up Kul Tiras are home to, or bordered by, tall mountains that act as barriers to travel or obstacles to overcome. Some of these mountains are easy to climb with obvious paths, others less so. And still others, such as the tallest mountains in Drustvar, are seemingly impossible, unless perhaps you are a demon hunter as indicated by this poor skeleton on the highest peak. I actually found this to be extremely disappointing. What fun is there in a mountain if you can't climb it? Could you imagine if a high mountain in Legion wasn't scalable? Still, there are plenty of secret trails between the mountains that get you from one valley to another. To the left of the cave in Golkavol, you can find a steep winding path to get you to the glacier above if you don't want to go the western route. A little east of Long Drop Hot Spring and Tiergard Sound, a faint bit of texture in the snow pointing north leads up a slope and over the ridge to the spruce wood in Stormsong Valley. Even farther to the east in the Mistfall Cleft, an unmarked path leads you up to a kite adventure platform where you can buy gliders to launch yourself to the surrounding lands below. Zandalar is, um, well Nazmir is a swamp, so it's pretty much flat besides the bowl in the middle. Muldoon is mostly flat being a desert, but the areas of interest around the edges have some cool terrain. In particular, I like the fact that you can run up the spine of the giant stone cobra. There's even a plank of wood for you to ride all the way back down on it in style. That being said, I actually like desert zones such as Voldun, Oldham, and Tenaris because of the rolling flat emptiness. As I said in the Onaran section, it's nice to have some variety to keep the more rugged zones special. Zoldazar is probably the closest to what I would call interesting, with its cliffy terrain and network of paths, but it has a similar issue to Kul Tiras, where these tall mountains are unscalable and simply mock me with their serpentine ridges that look vaguely pathish but are too steep to actually climb. Like. Look at this long grassy ridge leading to the top of the mountain. How cool would it have been if you could actually run up it to the very top where this dragon skeleton lies, and then you could have taken a goblin glider and gone anywhere else on the island. The last battle for Azeroth zone I want to talk about is Najdatar. Najdatar has a lot of features I love. Tall cliffs leading down these narrow canyons into the deep places. Arches and overhangs and platforms to climb around on. Ancient runes to explore, some of multiple levels. Back when it was current content, I greatly enjoyed running around it until I finally completed Pathfinder and got the ability to fly, and I continued enjoying the zone's many levels when I could fly. But there was one thing that bothered me, one really extremely important thing that could have made it so much better. Why wasn't the zone underwater? I mean seriously, it's a Naga zone, it's in the ocean, wouldn't that have made a lot more sense? It could have been Vashir 2.0. The 3D movement would have really made use of the tiered environment. Look at all these ledges and holes that I can sit on and fly through that weren't accessible until I unlocked flying. Like yeah, we eventually got to fly, but only after we had basically done all the content in the zone already. I know I've been raving a lot about how much fun ground travel can be, well to me at least, but the zone really seems like it was designed to be explored in the third dimension. And that isn't getting into how empty the zone looks when you're flying over it. Water themed zones are the type of zones that just feel wrong when there isn't, you know, water in them. Where are all the fish, and the dolphins, and the sea turtles, and sharks? They're in these impenetrable water walls, that's where they are. And perhaps Blizz was going for the empty shell of its former self to show how little Azura cares about the ocean she rules over vibe. But then why add all these rays everywhere? It's like they wanted to have sunlight to show off the beautiful coral ecosystem, but then had to justify it in the most bizarre way possible with these deep coral pods that somehow allow the rays to fly. Why not just, you know, have the zone be full of water and fill it with a bunch of fish of the Osteichthys variety? Couldn't they have at least filled half the zone with water? Also, I found this easel on bench and wanted to sit on the bench, but I couldn't because of these damnable invisible walls. As much as I love running around on the ground, pathfinding and puzzle solving, that doesn't mean fun navigation has to be limited to a 2D environment. It is possible to make an interesting interactive environment that takes advantage of all three dimensions. And I believe that figuring out what makes up such a zone will be important in the future. But for now, let's get back to questing. I launched myself from the seat of the Aspects towards Tearhold, which I knew was going to be an issue. 
In the lead up to this challenge, I had scouted it beforehand and knew that its sheer walls had no path to lead me up, and I would have to get creative. First thing I did was go back up to the fishing area. From here, I parkoured up the nearby waterfall as high as I could. I clambered along the ledge and used my Darkmoon cannon, but apparently the cannon doesn't really like tight ledges and it failed to launch me. Scratching my head at what I should do, I started to look through my toy tab for anything that could launch me into the air. Aviana's Feather only works in Warlord Zones. Brolfest Idol only works in Legion Zones. Eventually, after a bit of googling, I discovered the X-52 Rocket Helmet, which I luckily already had, and this was more than enough to get me to the top, for the price of half my HP and a 5 hour cooldown. Once at the top, it was only a matter of getting around all the mobs without dying. The questline itself was fairly easy, although I did make the unfortunate discovery that entering a follower dungeon will purge all your buffs, including my Sunworm Sand, which has a 24 hour cooldown and I had just applied it 10 minutes prior. Once the questline was completed, I actually went back to the fishing area to do a bit of experimenting. During the dungeon, I had remembered that Vengeance Demon Hunters have a heroic leap ability that replaces Felrush. Yeah, I, I don't play Demon Hunter that much, can you tell? And I wanted to see if I could scale the waterfall without using the toy. After a bit of trial and error, and with the help of a golden glider for forward momentum, I did manage to scale the waterfall. I tried the same thing at another set of waterfalls, more to the north, and found that I could make it up without the aid of the golden glider here. With that done, I did my victory run along the aqueducts, back to Valdraken. And if anyone is wondering if you can make it up with a non-demon hunter, I came back sometime later on two of my other characters, and found that if you climb halfway up this rock and use the rocket helm toy, it gives you just enough height. You just need some sort of way to propel yourself over to the platform, so either some sort of disengage ability or a golden glider. Due to the power of the rocket helm and its long cooldown, I decided to limit its use to situations where I had no other options. The last renowned questline I did was the Green Dragonflight questline. It starts up on the platform in the Shady Sanctuary. Unlike the last time I was here, I don't have the convenient ferry to get me up there, so I had to go the roundabout way of taking the road up to the top of the cliffs and gliding down. The questline itself was easy enough. Just run around the garden killing and collecting, side-eyeing Mr. Sussy Backo over here until his inevitable betrayal. After watching the cutscene setting up the final patch, I go to muster the druids and then head off to the Shadowlands to sacrifice Malfurion because Blizz made him too powerful and now they don't know what to do with him. Damn dude just got straight up deleted from existence. With that done, we head through the portal into the dream and start cleaning up the Primalists. After melting all the ice cubes and summoning Yuzura, we go through the portal to stop the traitor once and for all. Um, hmm. You guys aren't supposed to be here. I seem to have run into some kind of phasing problem. If I hand in the quest, will it let me continue? Nope, doesn't seem like it. Sorry, Garethus, looks like you're going to be frozen for a while longer. Yeah, so I couldn't actually continue this questline as intended. I even tried abandoning the Emerald Dream intro questline, but it just got shoved back into my quest log when I left Veldraken. I tried again while standing in the ancient bow, and the phasing did seem to shift, but not enough for me to actually continue the questline to the end. I'll have to return to this later. This is one of the annoying problems in WoW that has arisen over the last couple expansions. Blizz tries to herd you towards the newest content, but this makes it difficult to do things in chronological order. If a dev is watching this, might I suggest making the hero's call board a less intrusive way to direct players to new content? Anyways, since we went to the Shadowlands, I guess I'll talk about Shadowlands now. You know the drill by now. No flying until at least one major patch in and a completed Pathfinder achievement. Although in this case, the Pathfinder achievement itself was much easier to obtain once available, indicating Blizz's no-flight stand slowly eroding. The Shadowlands itself had a rather strange layout where zones floated in space, separated from each other, and you had to take a flight path to get between them. Even once flying became available, invisible walls would stop you from trying to fly the large gaps between the realms. While this worked atmospherically and story-wise to show how isolated the afterlives were from each other, I can't help but agree with other players that it didn't really make for good game design. Since you can't really do anything while on a flight path, it was basically just like having a long scenic loading screen every time you wanted to switch zones. As far as the zones themselves go, Bastion. Lots of gentle slopes, ramps, and steep cliffs with some canyons to the north. I would actually consider this one of the better zones in the game for fun ground travel if the flight path layout wasn't so shit. If you want a challenge and don't have it already, try getting the Silverwind Larian mount without flying. Maldraxxus. Organized, but fairly flat, comprised of three circles, with some mountain walls dividing them and paths linking the sub-areas together like the spokes of a wheel. Has some treasures on top of mushrooms that before flying you could only reach via a grappling puzzle and some parkour. Other than that, nothing too noteworthy. 
Hardin Weald, a somewhat deceptive zone that matches its fey inhabitants well. Built with many bowls, cliffs, jagged bark walls, and tangled bridges, the zone is somehow both maze-like and fairly straightforward to traverse, with the most difficult areas also being the most dangerous. So Revendreth is another one of those zones that I've noticed a bit of a split in the fanbase with. Either people loved it because of its atmospheric gothic architecture, or they hated it because they didn't know how to get around. And at first glance, the zone is a confusing maze of canyons, ramparts, bridges, and walls, but there's actually a bunch of quality of life features put in place to help ease this. First of all, the flight path layout is probably the best in Shadowlands. Not only that, but there are other forms of taxis, such as bat rides, sin runners, and carriages that help transport you around the map. Secondly, the zone is one giant cone. If you can get to the middle, you can get anywhere else, as long as you have a way of surviving the drop. And see all these red octagons scattered around the map? Every single one of them is an elevator. And thirdly, the road system itself is pretty expansive, linking all the wards together. Even in more built-up city-like areas around Castle Nathria, it's fairly easy to get to where you want to, as long as you can survive all the mobs. All in all, Revendreff is a great zone, as is to be expected as a creation of the one and only Daddy D. But those are just the leveling zones. What about the max level endgame zones? Welcome to hell. The Maw is an extremely dangerous zone. And as I've sort of implied earlier, Blizz really likes to make the more dangerous areas a lot harder to navigate than the safe areas. It has narrow bridges over the void and areas filled to the brim with dangerous elite mobs. So not only is the zone built entirely around the concept of ground travel, it's to the point that when Pathfinder was eventually released and flying allowed in all the other zones, the Maw remained as ground only. Of course, this is a video game, which means progress. And in the Maw, this meant unlocking more ways to move around. Over time, as you gathered Stygia and more reputation with Venari, you could unlock things like grappling hooks that could be used as shortcuts, or transportation points that could take you safely from one part of the map to the other. And oh yeah, did I mention that until doing a certain 9.1 campaign quest, you couldn't even use mounts? Well, unless you were a worgen or a druid, then you could just be your own mount. I actually like the Maw conceptually. I will never dunk on the game devs for trying out something new, but I feel like the zone design team may have done a bit too good of a job with the concept of make literal hell a zone. In other words, cool idea, please never do it again. Just a quick word on Corthia, the other half of the mall introduced in 9.1. The giant gorge needed more ways to cross it, and more importantly, there are too many mobs. Doing activities in this area on any tune that wasn't a hunter, rogue, or night elf sucked, because I would just constantly be stuck in combat. But the Maw, and by extension Corthia, wasn't the final endgame zone of Shadowlands. The zone devs may have overcooked when it came to the Maw, but Zareph Mortis was cooked to perfection. Introduced in 9.2, the final patch of Shadowlands, with its otherworldly designs, primitive shapes, and rhythmic music composition, the zone really captured the essence of being the workshop of the gods. Zareth Mortis starts you out as ground only. It was only over the course of several weeks, the main time gate being the campaign quest line, that you unlock flying in this zone. But in those few weeks, I made it my mission to complete as much content in Xerath Mortis as possible, with the tools available to me before flying came out. You see all these hexagonal pillars? Do you know what's special about them? Well, I'll tell you. They're beveled. Do you know what that means? It means you can get on top of them. You can't do that with normal pillars or platforms. With a combination of the dimensional leave gloves you can get within the zone, Door of Shadows, and Feral Charge, I made the zone my personal jungle gem. I got several treasures before I was likely even supposed to get them, including the penguin soul shape, which I discovered by complete accident. And I solved a good chunk of the Resonant Peaks puzzle before the quest related to the area even came out. Basically, anything that wasn't locked behind a quest that wasn't available yet was fair game. This zone really excelled at interactive zone design. The whole zone felt like one big puzzle, with many rewards scattered throughout, a lot of which I didn't even know would be there until I actually clambered my way up to their location, expecting nothing else but a pretty view. Truly, the best kind of exploring is when you are pleasantly surprised. If I had one bad thing to say about the zone, it's the invisible walls penning you in. There's a lot of land along the outer edges that look like they'd be fun to explore and would have been excellent places to put treasures for when you could finally fly, a sort of bonus unlock if you will. But unfortunately, these areas are merely window dressing. Okay, like, I understand that the area that's supposed to be the raid being blocked off, but at least make them shimmering magical walls that only show up when you get close to them, and not invisible walls that take you out of the immersion. 
And as for the rest of the zone, just let us fly out into the void. Or even better, do something wacky like flying too far in one direction teleports you to the other side of the map. Come on, Blizz, just make your zone borders interesting. Even a fatigue is better than invisible walls. Since I have no more previous expansions to talk about, it's just Dragonflight from here on out. With the Ysera questline on hold, I headed to the Forbidden Reach. Luckily for me, the Flight Master was willing to give me a lift there even though I didn't have the flight path. Upon arrival, I got hit with my first obstacle. Emberthal is high up on a cliff. Now I could have used the Rocket Helm or even tried Vengeance Leaps to get up, but I wanted to see if I can get up as Havoc first, so I ran around the island trying to find any sort of route up. Eventually I found a rather convoluted method of gliding from ledge to ledge around the back of the island until I had finally reached Emberthal. As mentioned at the start of the video, I had only planned on doing the Sojourner side quests, so from here on out I'm skipping the side quests and only sticking to the main campaigns. For the most part, it's pretty straightforward. Most of the island is easily accessible by ground. To reach Talon Damos and the Lost Athenium, you just need to go up the ramp inside the nearby building and take the short path to the top. Talon Lord's Perch, on the other hand, is not so easy. You can just walk into the lower part, but the upper part required me to use my Dark Moon Cannon to reach. After saving all the researchers and slaying the Wing Lord, I pretend to listen to Abyssian's exposition and then head off to Dragon Skull Island. The island is near sea level and there's a handy ramp to get you up to where you need to go, so no problems there. With the Forbidden Reach campaign over and done, Abyssian gives me a lift back to Valdraken. The Zerla Cavern campaign starts at the top of the Sea of the Aspects, which means I get to launch myself off. Whee! Getting into Zerla Cavern itself is pretty easy, just jump down the big hole and run through the tunnel. Zerlek, for the most part, is pretty flat. There are plenty of crystalline columns and small cliffs, but these never really seem to get in the way. The Jardin area is slightly more difficult to get around, as there are more cliffs, ramps, and rivers of magma, and big elites that I have to either run through or kill. This area also has an anti-air aura that dismounts you if you fly around for too long, but that's not something I have to worry about. Oh boy, I sure do love fighting mobs with a shit ton of HP, especially when paired with mobs that go immune until you kill their four totems, who also have a shit ton of HP, so you have to do this more than once in order to kill them. After Furak took off to turn Loam into the world's biggest oven, I quickly helped Sibillian unstab Abyssian, and then it was a matter of flying through these circles to put out the fires. Hmm. Yeah, so it turns out, just like the dragon flying tutorial, you don't actually have to be flying in order to get credit for the circles. And luckily for me, most of them were low enough to the ground where I could just glide through them. The only real challenge were some elite mobs patrolling the researchers under fire area, but other than that, this quest was an easy complete. Although probably only because I was a demon hunter. I feel like other classes would have had a much harder time. And this is where I did something silly. After returning to Veldraken, I completely forgot to do the second half of the Zorilla campaign. I got sidetracked by other things, like PvP and my Warcraft 3 Let's Play, which is taking me way longer than I thought it would take. And by the time I came back to this project, I had completely forgotten that I hadn't actually finished Zerlek, and so all the footage you see from here on out is actually me coming back post-Emerald Dream to finish it up. Shadow to busy and squared. Really, there isn't that much left. Kallik is nice enough to give me a port. Not today. That was too close, friend. It's okay, Kalik. I'm a demon hunter, I got wings. And I just follow the road to reach the next quest objective. The northern part of Zeraluk is a bit more cliffy of rivers of magma throughout, but there are plenty of ramps, paths, and bridges to get around with. The only real rust spot was getting to the quest givers that decided to sit on top of the tower in the brimstone garrison. This required a bunch of demon hunter parkour in order to get high enough to glide over, but the rest of the quest line was obstacle free. I did do the post-raid quest lines as well, but there isn't really much to say about it. So it's time to be off to the Emerald Dream. Okay, Chandris, I know it's been several months, but I'm finally ready to help you with whatever thing you need help with. I flew over to the Shady Sanctuary and ran over to where Chandris was to find out that Lunadane is up on a high ledge with no real way to climb up. I could have probably used Vengeance Jumps or Toys to get up there, but I decided just to head back to the mainland and glide down from a high cliff instead. The questline itself was pretty straightforward, although Chandra's did have to save me at one point from my own intrusive thoughts. With that done, Chandra's gives me a lift back to Veldraken, where it suddenly gets very cold. Everyone heads down to the lower level and I follow. Um, guys, I don't think that's how repelling ropes are supposed to work. At the bottom we meet Viranov, who is chill now. I <laughs> get it, cause she, you know, she's, she, okay, never mind. Anyways, with all that out of the way, it's finally time to head to the Emerald Dream. 
Oh, hey, Gareth. Uh, still frozen, I see. I talked to Marithra and entered the portal. Oh, Garethus, you're suddenly unfrozen. That's weird. I handed in the next quest and witnessed the Druids of the Flame assault the Emerald Dream. I then immediately turned around and headed back out the portal. Oh, whoa, suddenly everything is frozen again. Hey, Ysera, and I'll kill you, and I'll kill you, and oh boy, this day one pre-patch leg is really bad. And free you, and free you, and free you too, Garethus. If the Primalist cleared, Marithra and her mom have a tearful reunion before giving me a lift back to Lunadane. After fighting even more Primalists, I met up with Marithra and witnessed Ysera gracefully flow down from the sky. Some green dragon stuff happened that I'm too demon hunter brain to understand, and with that, I finally completed all the renown campaigns. I was expecting an achievement toast, but I guess with the new warband system, it no longer tracks character-specific progress. I am dissatisfied by this, but really it's my own fault for not completing it sooner. Back to the Emerald Dream, and like Zerilek Cavern, I was given the task to put out some fires by flying through some hoops, but unlike Zerilek, these rings were much higher and there wasn't any nearby terrain that was high enough for me to glide from. I attempted to use toys, but I quickly realized that even when using the Rocket Helm, which I remind you has a 5 hour cooldown, I wouldn't have had enough height to reach any but the lowest rings. Now oddly enough, the quest itself says that I can either use my dragon riding mount or talk to a nearby fairy drake. I believe the fairy drake was supposed to be an accessibility mount for those who couldn't use dragon flying, and I did say that temporary mounts given to you by quests would be allowed, but for whatever reason it didn't seem to be functional. I did discover that if you could manage to get through the lowest ring, whether via toy or some other method, and re-logged, the ring would respawn, meaning you could go through it over and over again for credit. But since I didn't want to wait a week for toy cooldowns, I decided just to fly for the rings and be on my way. However, this quest was bothering me so much that a few days later I returned on an alt to see if I could find a better method. I found that if I launched myself from the top of the nearby cliff, I was able to golden glide through a single ring. The problem was actually getting up to this cliff. The only method I found to reach it without using the rocket helmet was to vengeance leap up the side of the cliff. And even when you did get to the main portion, getting up to the tippy top isn't really possible as a non-demon hunter, and jumping off from the next highest point leaves you just short of the ring. So while this quest is possible to do without flying and toys, you need to be a demon hunter. Continuing on, I resume my groundbound adventure. The following quests weren't anything too worthy of mentioning, just a lot of running around and talking to people and killing. The zone itself is quite beautiful, and I found myself enjoying the ambience as I trundled along the path. It took me back to memories of my younger days, of running back and forth through Ashenvale, simply absorbing the world around me. Heh heh heh. Oh wait, I still need to go for the whole cave, don't I? I always found it funny that the Druids of the Flame recruited primarily by telling everyone that Tyrande was going to force them to play Shadowlands. Like guys, if you're so afraid of Shadowlands, then why did you recruit a guy named Sylvanish? The quest to stop Lethka from exploding a mountain seemed like it would be difficult at first, but I found an easily walkable lava flow on the southern side of the mountain to get up with. Uh, Viranoth, are, are you okay? After yet another meeting with the dragon crew that could have been an email, I was sent to the Eye of Ysera, but this time they gave me a portal. How handy. Not much to say here. Do quests, glide over the water, do quests, head back via the ramp on the north side, realize that I actually forgot to complete one of the quests, glide over the water again, complete quest, head back again, realize I accidentally jumped to the giant toilet bowl, climb back out, jump off the right cliff this time, take the ramp back up, hand in quest. One big fight later, including a portion where they're nice enough to give me an NPC mount to shoot flying enemies out of the sky, and I'm back at the central encampment. Last leg of the campaign now, I head to the Vernt Pass and start doing what I do best, killing things. At one point, I also need to free some ancients, which is easy enough, but one is up on a floating ledge, which I need to parkour up to re- Oh, oh wait, I could have just gone here from the flight path. Never mind. Next up is breaking the skyfire turrets around the entrance to the wellspring. You just walk up the ramp. She is in humanoid form. Why does Birak not just simply sit on her? Is he stupid? 
Also, I know people find this cutscene extremely cheesy, but man, do I love cheese. They want me to dragon ride and fly through enemy protodrakes in order to kill them, but unlike the ring quest at the beginning, this quest actually gives me an accessibility mount so I don't have to do it. I don't even have to target the protodrakes, just mash one until it says the quest is complete. The next quest is probably one of my favorites in all of Dragonflight. Just seeing all the named characters I've gone to know over the years join forces and come together and banter with each other is just super fun and a great end to the main questing campaign. But with the Prophet defeated, there is one final challenge that awaits. So the Tindril fight has flying as part of it, and I didn't know until recording this, but if you just wait around on the platforms until the rest of the group has progressed enough, a big green portal opens up and you can just walk through it to reach the next platform. The actual final challenge is, um, yeah, I can't actually get through this big ass rift that Firak makes. Gliders and toys don't work in raids and there's no give me a lift option to get to Firak's room. In the end, I just flew there because this is LFR and I wanted to actually complete the raid and I needed to get there before the group pulled. But I decided to stick around afterwards to see if I can figure out a way in. As I thought, there isn't any way to enter the rift without the help of others, either through summons or having someone set the reds checkpoint in Firak's room. So unfortunately, the raid is not possible without flight, unless you have someone in your group to do all the flying for you, at which point it sort of defeats the purpose of a no-flying challenge. And so ends Dragonflight. After doing a bunch of epilogue quests, including checking up on all the friends I've made along the way, I bid my flightless adventure adieu. So how did my experience doing as much of Dragonflight without flight compared to past expansions? Well, as far as main quest lines go, it wasn't much different. Primary quest lines tend to be pretty straightforward, follow the road type deals. I was actually kind of surprised just how much I could get away without flying given dragon riding is the entire gimmick of the expansion. Which makes me wonder if Blizz planned at some point to have Dragonflight work like past expansions, or flying was limited for a time before changing their minds and giving you a flight almost right from the start. Alternatively, they could have simply been aware of the small percentage of insane players like myself who purposely choose to experience the world from the ground only and design the world with us in mind. Or it could be an accessibility thing. Some people get nausea or vertigo when exposed to fast movement, and having ground travel as an option 99% of the time would help them a lot. The other aspect of my experience I want to talk about is the stuff I didn't do. I didn't do every side quest for one thing, I also didn't do any world quests. In the past, I found that a lot of travel interactions happen during the post-campaign game, when having to quickly plan out the most efficient route between several world quests that often involved a lot of off-road travel. There are other things I skipped as well, such as treasures and gathering reagents like herbs and minerals. And lastly, I want to talk about how big the zones felt. The Dragonflight zones are large, but I didn't really feel the size much. Likely because I was going from quest to quest, there wasn't actually a whole lot of running in between activities. Although, it could also just be me having YouTube and Reddit open on the side to look at while traveling. Another option is simply that I'm just used to zones of this size. When I went back to older zones to collect footage, I was surprised by how small they felt, even when running around on the ground and not flying. I do like how faster modes of travel have allowed Blues to create more expansive zones. But now, I want to talk about dragon riding itself. Dragon Riding is Blizz's answer to the several expansions old problem of how do we make zones interactive while also allowing players to travel from point A to point B as fast as possible. While Old Steady Flight allowed you to basically have complete freedom in movement, including the ability to turn on a dime and hover indefinitely, Dragon Riding is much more limited in that regard. Unless you land, you're constantly moving. There is an arc to turning, and the only way to stop in the air is to use the aerial halt ability, which only greatly slows you down for a few seconds before gravity takes full effect. There is, of course, the trade-off. Speed. These changes to flying make things like questing a lot less convenient. And this is by design. Blizz wants this. Blizz wants questing areas to feel dangerous. They want you to have to actually consider the terrain and mob locations around you. All of you asking for area halt to allow your mount steady flight for 5 seconds, or for instance swapping flight styles mid-air, are not likely to get your wish for the same reason that Blues still keeps Pathfinder around for steady flight even when we can still fly. Because they don't want you using it. But despite Blizz wanting all these barriers in place, that doesn't mean they aren't against throwing us a bone. The Dragonflight zones have many small features that allow for at least some convenience. Blizz may not want you to infinitely hover over a quest objective, but that doesn't mean they can't have a nearby ledge branch or tall rock for you to perch on while you wait. Speaking of perches, 
Blizz took this finding somewhere to perch aspect even further by introducing small challenges, like these flags on top of narrow mountain peaks. Something that would be abysmally easy with steady flight becomes a learning experience of dragon riding as you get more skilled at steering. Because dragon riding is a skill, something that allows for expression of mastery. Remember what I said earlier about developing mastery being fun? It's actually rather interesting how Blizz slowly trains you over time to use dragon flying. From the zone you start in, the Waking Shore, with its many canyons, mountain ledges, and towers that allow you to slowly get used to the controls and use of vigor, to the Glyph System, where you seek out these glowing runes to better your capabilities while continuously practicing your skills. To the Race and World Quest System, where your increasing ability to turn tightly and manage vigor finally sees some application. But you know what I'm interested in? The future because I know for a fact that flying is here to stay, but I want to speculate on how the interactivity of ground travel can be applied to flying. I have purposely stayed away from the Wharf and Beta to avoid spoiling, so I have no idea what, if any, type of designs and mechanics Blizz has implemented, but that doesn't mean I can't come up with my own ideas of what I'd like to see. One thing that has been bothering me in Dragonflight is that outside of the Glyph system, which is a one-time thing, there isn't really any place for skill expression or rewarding activities other than world quests and racing, which are attached to very specific areas, leaving the rest of the world, the in-between, as something just to be skipped over. Blizz seems to be at least somewhat aware of this, as they have introduced Dream Surge Coalescence, which can be obtained by flying for these green blobs, which are often placed at points of interest, like tall mountain peaks or under arches. This system was further expanded upon in Remix, where blob locations became much more varied, and the bronze you got could be used to purchase things like transmog sets. I definitely hope that Blizz further develops this in the future, little treats for going out of your way. But you know what I'd really like to see utilized more? Caves. Yeah, I know we have several up-and-coming underground zones in the War of Thin, but I keep harping on caves for a reason, and that's because most caves are just huge, wide-open areas that might as well not be caves, and the caves that look like they'd actually be fun to fly through won't let you. I think the idea of having a ceiling is extremely underutilized. Not only does it limit and direct people's direction of travel, but it can also be yet another place to put things of interest. I'd also like to see more verticality applied to cave-like environments, deep chasms with multiple levels, maze-like tunnel systems that go in all directions, or even tightly packed pillars that you need to slalom through. To put it more simply, I want a waking shore with a ceiling, and not Onoran plains with a ceiling. Of course, what I want doesn't necessarily mean that the rest of the player would enjoy it, so it would be best to keep these kinds of things to sub-areas and not the entire zone. One aspect of ground travel I would love to see implemented in 3D space is the idea of secret shortcuts. Small, narrow, and hard-to-see caves that take you through a wall that you would otherwise have to fly around. This can be combined with the aforementioned mazes and slalom pillars to create a sort of risk-reward gameplay loop for travel. I also think it would be fun to have gathering nodes that float high up in the air, there's always at least one ore node floating 10 feet in the air at the start of every expansion. Why not just make it a gameplay feature? Last suggestion. Please, Blizz, in the name of Elune, the Light, and the Loa, can we please have at least one more underwater zone? I swear, if Ajara and Ornega become relevant again, and we don't get at least one more underwater zone, I will... I will... Well, I'll be extremely disappointed. Please, just like, half a zone, at the very least? Like I said, I haven't been paying attention to the Wharf and Beta, especially the zone designs, so I have no idea what awaits me on launch day. I am very curious to see what Blizz does with the various zones and how walkable they are. I may even challenge myself to try to play through it without flying the first time, to see how much Blizzard does cater to the ground-only crowd. If I do, I fully expect it to be a lot harder than Dragonflight, as I would be doing a blind and Blizz would very likely have further expanded on flight integration. I guess that's something I'll have to find out for myself. Thanks for watching. I hate outros. Like and subscribe. Bye.